uh, so frost machines, and we've got to get in and cultivate and mow the cover crops just to, you know, to help out with, uh, with the frost. So we're getting back to work. Cool. Uh, I, I bet it's reassuring to sort of when everything is uncertain, there's got to be, you know, because I live in a city, so that, like there's no natural, I mean, there's a little bit of like, you know, there's flowers and things, but like I'm a city person. It must be really reassuring to see Mother Nature sort of, um, like the rhythm of Mother Nature doesn't really know that there's a pandemic. It's just, you know, it's time for bud break and it's time for bud break, you know? It, well, exactly. And that that's, I mean, th that definitely brings joy walking vineyards and seeing buds push and growth, you know, and it kind of, it focused, you know, I think it's probably being like a, a mother. It m makes you kind of block out all the distraction and focus on, you know, what's important. And, you know, when we first were shut down, when basically Napa was shut down, uh, and Napa was late for all the Northern California counties. The day I was leaving the winery and there at uh, Ellers Lane, they were out there in the rain. Lane, they just tore out the vineyard. They were laying out the new vineyard. And I remembered, you know, the one quote that, you know, to plant something is to believe in the future. You know, and we just had had a talk with all our guys, you know, at the different wineries and just said, everyone's going home. You know, and it was a pretty, you know, we kind of locked the cellar and kind of everyone laughed and driving there. And I, it was, that was reassuring to see, you know, people are out planting vineyards, you know, so, I mean, th they're, they're planning on that everything's happening in three years. So that, that makes me happy. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great story. So, well, you know, and I hope your family's safe and everybody's well. Everyone's safe. Yes. Because I think that what we're going to learn probably through this episode is maybe a reordering of priorities kind of going forward, sadly. Right. Um, but anyway, that's good to hear. So um, probably a lot of people, most people probably know you as being the wine director at Turley. You know, you yes. You make something like 45 or 46 wines. I've lost count. I just know that it requires me going twice a year. <laughs> not right. to check, But you make a huge number, a very wide um, rate, a wide range of, um, of wines. Yes. And, um, so the question is, um, across a lot of different grapes and a lot of, ac across, across a lot of different grape types. So what was the inspiration for, for Sandlands exactly? Well, I think, you know, when I started off, you know, as a winery worker, I traveled around and then in 2003, I got hired at Turley to work for, uh, you know, for, for a 10 week internship and Aaron Jordan was my boss then. And, you know, I started there and, you know, Aaron had his own project Fela going and he, he was a young guy at the time. I mean, this was, you know, 17 years ago. So he was in his mid thirties and had a wine project and, you know, it just definitely was one of those things where I'm like, wow, I want to do that someday, you know? And so I kind of, uh, you know, I kind of thought, you know, how do I, and I'll be honest, growing up in Napa, you know, I didn't know really anyone when I was younger who really had their own wine project. I mean, John Kongsgaard, he started his project, but that was pretty late. But, you know, friends and families, parents who worked in the wine industry, no one made their own wine. So it seemed kind of a long shot. And then, you know, working for Aaron, it was just like, you know, you see someone do it, you know, and uh, you, you believe that, yeah, I can do it too. So, uh, you know, that was the thing. And I kind of wanted to do it for a number of years. And Aaron was actually the one who told me, he said, if I can give you a bit of advice, two things, if you, I know you want to start your own project, do it before you get married and have kids, you know, and don't take on any investors. He said, if it takes you 10 years longer to do it on your own, wait. And what I ended up doing was I thought, okay, well, why don't I just start smaller than most people would? So, I made a little bit of wine in 2009 that I ended up bulking out. And that's probably my biggest regret in the wine industry because the wines were good. They just weren't exactly what I wanted to release at first, but I really wish I had those wines uh, now. And then 2010 was the first vintage that I released. And I did three wines. I did the Carignan that will taste. I did uh, a Mataro that was from two vineyards. And then I, uh, also did a Syrah up from Amador County. Cool. Well, just taking a half a step back, as, as I'm just curious because I don't think I've ever asked you, as I, as I recall, 
your your, your studies were actually in public health, curiously, right? They were, yes. So was there like an aha moment for wine or how did that happen? Y yeah, so I, my first couple jobs in the wine industry were in labs. The first one was at a winery called Golden State Vintners, where his Hall Winery is. And that used to be the big St. Helena co-op. And basically when Golden State Vintners owned it, it was still run like the big Napa co-op. I mean, it's really amazing that I got 20 years ago to work in a winery that was kind of that, you know, archaic in the middle of Napa Valley. And so then I went to Napa Wine Company and at Napa Wine Company, I met uh, a number of winemakers. Everyone was kind of making wine there. But the one person that I met that I really, you know, uh, admired and looked up to was Andy Smith. He was making the Lark Mead and he was making Gemstone back then at the time there. And Andy helped me get a job in New Zealand. I'd only worked in the lab and, you know, he had worked in New Zealand. He'd studied in New Zealand and even though he's Scottish and he, uh, yeah, just, you know, I, I went and worked at Craigie range their second year. You know, I met a lot of amazing people there. You know, I see the hilt back there, Matt Dees and I lived together. We shared a room and we knew each other a little bit before then, but, uh, in New Zealand kind of really, you know, it's the first time I'd ever left the country. So for me, that was, a, my parents haven't left the country. So it was a pretty big step for me. Uh, and then, you know, after that, I got offered a 10-week internship at Turley and kind of that New Zealand experience, definitely, you know, I, when I came back to Turley, I thought maybe I still will go into public health, but you know, I was bit by the travel bug and, you know, I, I'd fell in love, fallen in love with wine before. So it, it just kind of all happened, but I definitely, once I started at Turley, you know, seeing how wine was made at Turley and how we farmed the vineyards, it was just kind of like, yep, this is what I, this is what I want to do. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting because right now there's this, there's this kind of renewed um, uh, sort of, uh, focus on these old vine heritage sites, own rooted, dry farmed. Um, but Larry's doing that quite, quite before most people. Right, uh, for sure. And now, obviously, there's a res resurgence of interest with you and a lot of your, your, your sort of peers, more sort of generational peers, I mean, and I think it's just fascinating. So what is it? I mean, there's always this focus also at Sandlands on own rooted historical sites. So beyond the obvious, like, you know, explain to us what the what the what is it about, for example, own rooted vines that is different from what today would be more conventionally farmed vines? Is it about yield? Is it about canopy? Is it about uh, something harder to explain? What is it that's at the attraction? Well, I, I think the easiest thing to think about is you realize when vines are on rootstock next to vines that are own rooted, how much, a, you know, Again, with, you know, you can grow Pinot Noir in the Central Valley on the right rootstock and get a high yield, you know, where, you know, the rootstock can, it can be so vigorous that it counteracts the, the vines, you know, what the vine actually wants to do. So I think, you know, we've, some people have used, you know, rootstocks to their advantage to grow things that shouldn't be grown in that climate, you know, because the rootstock can kind of, equalize a lot of that clearly you're you know you'd still get sunburn and you know there might be other issues of no acidity and you know maybe flavors you're not looking for but you know with own rooted vines you know you think of all the research that was done in burgundy before that wasn't done on rootstock you know it was done on own rooted vines and i think you know if we were able to still do that you know when i worked in france and the guys were going through suckering the rootstocks down at the bottom of the trunk, they would break them off and say, I know it was for my, you know, enjoyment, but they say fucking American, you know, <laughs> and they would, you know, rootstock, they'd sucker off the rootstocks uh, because, you know, the rootstock were pushing and, you know, the suckers were pretty vigorous, but uh, I, again, I think they were definitely doing it for my enjoyment, but uh you know, no, I think it, it's interesting. I mean, I think rootstock has allowed us to grow grapevines in places that we wouldn't have been able to grow them at economical yields. So, and, you know, I think the thing is, when you see vines that are growing on their own roots, you kind of realize that, you know, we're probably lucky, you know, that we might, we won't be able to work with vines like this forever, is my belief. You know, it's like, working with the Hain Vineyard, you know, that's in, you know, some of Napa Valley's best soils. I mean, 
I think I'll be able to tell the boys, you know, one day we worked with Zinfandel that was planted in these soils and they go, really, there was Zinfandel back then, you know, and uh, so I feel like, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, we really have to kind of learn from and appreciate why we have the time. Yeah, so for people who don't know, the Hain Vineyard is a historic vineyard in St. Helena. Um, and probably there, one of the issues is just the economics of Cabernet Sauvignon versus Zinfandel and Petit Syrah, right? That's another factor that's kind of... For sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so, okay, so old vines, and then, but when you have ungrafted vines, you're also more vulnerable to disease. Phylloxera being the most, the most devastating, right? Be, Phylloxera would be the most, but also nematodes as well, you know, and it's just the vigor of the root zone isn't as vigorous that you would see on, on, you know, primarily with old vineyards in California, it's either their own rooted or they're on St. George rootstock, a repestrous rootstock, which is a pretty vigorous rootstock. So real, realistically with old vineyards, you have a choice of one or the other. And, uh, you know, St. George is very resistant to phylloxera and it's very uh, drought tolerant. So, so, I mean, it's actually pretty remarkable that all of these sites even exist at all, I think. Oh, it is. And I mean, for example, you know, in, you know, I know we're going to taste the mission from Amador County. And that's the oldest vineyard left in the United States that's productive. But there's phylloxera in Amador County now, you know, where all these vineyards, I mean, there are a lot of vineyards planted in the late 70s that were still being planted in Amador County ungrafted. You know, it wasn't until the 80s and 90s that people started putting vines on rootstock as phylloxera showed up. But, you know, that's showing up 100 years after it showed up in, you know, St. Helena. So, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. Even in St. Helena, it showed up a lot later than Sonoma or Southern Napa. So everywhere that phylloxera hasn't shown up over time, you know, everyone thinks that they're resistant, you know, until they're not. So... <laughs> You know, it, it'll get you at some point. It just, you know, that's the fascinating thing with the foothills. It took a hundred years, you know, and Lodi is this big sand squirt in between, you know, so I think Lodi being the sand squirt definitely helped being a big buffer uh, in between that they didn't have a lot of vineyards all going up to the foothills that had phylloxera. Yeah, what I'd always been told, but it's probably not scientific, that sandier sites are more resistant to phylloxera because the sand can fill where there's little, where there's damages from the, from. What I've read a lot is that the, actually it's not as much sand as it, it's the silica, you know, and silica is an irrit. You think of, you know, human beings can get silicosis is that, you know, uh, and it actually acts not unlike asbestos uh, issues that you get in your lungs where basically it, it kind of binds in your lungs and, you know, I was telling someone how I've read a lot that the silica content was a big uh, indicator if vines would get phylloxera or not. And they said, oh, that's interesting because that's the same thing they use for flea powder. You know, it's, they use a lot of, so, and it's, it's, uh, it's a similar uh, thing, but, you know, I definitely think it's, it's sandy soils and, you know, the lack of, you know, clay and water holding capacity. You know, it's also a a better distributed root zone. I know I've heard stories when John Williams bought his current property, you know, that they were putting up irrigation and it had AXR1. And that was like the death, they actually, they ended up not irrigating it, but that was the way to kill vineyards on AXR1 was actually to put up irrigation. You're bringing the roots up closer to the surface and uh, more susceptible to attack. Yeah. And you're referring to John Williams of Frog's Leap, right? It wrote Frog's Leap, right. Who was an early partner of Larry's. He was, yes. So going to your wines and Sandlands, tell us a little bit about the, the, the sort of the name of where it comes from and what the inspiration is for this range. So the name actually comes from a wine that my friend, uh, so Abe Scherner, who was a big influence on me, he, he, I met him in about 2003 in Napa. And I was going and visiting the vineyards in Contra Costa for Turley. And Abe and I kind of, you know, geeked out on some of the old Ridge wines, not just from Contra Costa, but Ridge in general. And he said one day, he's like, I've always wanted to go out to Contra Costa. And so I st he started coming out with me and I helped him get some grapes in 2004 from Joe Duarte. And 
then Abe started saying, when we would go out, he said, can we go out to the Sandlands? And he actually named one of his wines Sandlands first. So it was, you know, this kind of, he and I shared a lot of vineyards and spent a lot of time together traveling. Uh, and we basically, you know, one day I was saying, you know, I think that's what I'd like to call, I'd started with Contra Costa grapes. I'm like, that's what I want to call my wine brand. Cool. That's uh, really interesting. And you've got this, this range that's uh, fascinating to taste because unless you're really familiar with these grapes in California, there's not so many reference points, you know, like, so. Well, and, and that was, there's a good friend of mine who she sells wine in New York and we've got, and she comes out to taste about once a year and we always get in arguments that I don't vineyard designate my wines. And, you know, I've said, do you know the difference? If I told you what vineyard it was in Contra Costa, would you know the difference? And, you know, Morgan with his purchase of Evangelo and, you know, some other things, it's, there's definitely more attention, but, you know, a lot of the vineyards, even wine buyers and people who knew California wines, I try to tell them where the vineyards were and they had no idea. And I'm like, well, the vineyard designate is, I think at that point, it was probably being overused with, you know, modern plantings of Russian River Pinot, you know, there were like 12,000 vineyard designate Russian River Pinots that no one had ever heard of. And uh, I just, it was just like, you know, I don't think I need to vineyard designate. Oh, you know, I'm happy to tell people where the vineyard is and the story. And I, I've never hidden what vineyards are in, in the wines, but I just thought, let's just focus on, you know, the region and, and the grape variety and kind of the history of the vines and where they're grown. Yeah, I mean, for sure, there's a lot to grasp, you know, when, when, when I think or anybody tastes your wines, because again, there's, there's not, you know, so like, you know, maybe we could, talk about the mission, you know, which is, which sure. is here, uh, which this was, I don't know. I mean, Tegan, you're a much more um, not knowledgeable historian than I am, but for sure. But mission was the red grape in California. What was it not? It was until, uh, you know, really until the 1860s, eight, you know, for the first about 40, 50 years of, you know, grape growing in, in California, that was the wine. And, you know, you think of everything down in, you know, Los Angeles County. I mean, that was where most of the mission was growing. And so this, there's very few, I think I've only tasted one other mission wine. I mean, this is, a, you know, I mean, you're sort of, you said it's the, excuse me, the oldest vineyard still, the oldest vineyard that's still producing in America. That that's what that's the way Ken Deaver, the owner of the vineyard, says that you know I think there are some older vines down in Los Angeles County. There's like, vines and in 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 the town and the vineyard, most of it that's there was planted in 1854, and you know it's a truly fascinating. And I'm sorry, I should have. I know I was supposed to send you some photos, but you know it's interesting because the people who were planting grape vines in Amador County, right at the end of the gold rush, they weren't viticulturists, you know, so most of the old vineyards look more like uh, fruit trees, you know, they were arborists, you know, they knew how to grow fruit trees, but they, you know, a lot of people who were going up there just decided to, you know, plant the mission. So it's kind of these branched arms. And I mean, to me, that's one of the biggest indicators in some of the oldest vineyards around they weren't always planted, you know, by the kind of later on in the 1870s and 1880s, you started to see more of a German and Italian influence planting vineyards. But before that, it was kind of, you know, a, a free for all and it was agriculture. So those in some of the old viticulture books from Italy, I mean, there were thousands of way to trade vines that we would think are crazy now. So, I mean, it was just a different way of doing it, but the, the vines are huge, you know, the fruit, uh, it's very stable fruit. That's to me, like when you taste the grapes, the grapes themselves, they almost taste more like a fig, you know, they're waxy, they're thick skinned. And that was the thing. The wine itself wasn't that stable, but the fruit was. So to get the wine into winemaking, you know, you didn't have, you know, a crew of 20 people to pick 20 tons before, you know, 9 a.m., you know, you needed, you know, to be able to pick a little bit and transport it and for it not to spoil. So that's what, and historically what a lot of places did with mission is they would make enough wine for
for about one year of table wine and the rest they would make into Angelica, which was fortified with brandy. So that wine would have the stability to last and keep, you know, through, you know, time. I mean, you think of everything this vineyard's been through, you know, uh, the Civil War, World War One, World War Two. You think of, you know, it's pretty amazing, you know, and I think it, again, vineyards of this age, it's an inspiration when you think the whole world's going to hell that, you know, it's been around for almost 170 years. So, yeah, I mean, that must just be amazing. One of the things that's, I think, interesting about this wine is it tastes and feels like a delicate wine, but there's still a nice, there's still a lot of structure in it. It's sort of deceptively airy, but on the finish, you really get this tannin, and, and that must be why it works well as a fortified, well, in addition well, to the, the of course. The thing that Amador County has going for it that other places don't is, and you've tasted a lot of the Turley wines, they're very high in acid, and then they're very high in tannin. And so even though this isn't high in acid and, you know, it's, it's basically, this has the acid that you'd probably find in, you know, it's like three, seven, five pH, kind of more what you'd find in maybe, you know, Russian river Pinot Noir, but it has that granitic tannin from, you know, that Amador County has a pretty short growing season, later bud break, earlier harvest due to the later bud break is due to the Sierra Nevadas and the snowpack and you know, but it has really cold nights, so it retains its acidity really well. So Mission as a still wine, I think, is one of the better places to grow because if you look at the Zinfandels, they can be 16% with a 3.3 finished pH, you know. So, uh, you know, the Mission isn't that high, but, you know, for Mission, I think it does pretty well. Yeah, and so help us understand, for those of us who don't know, Amador County, like what... Uh, Help us visualize that. Where are we exactly? So Amador County is about 45 minutes uh, southeast of Sacramento. So if you were going from Sacramento uh, to Lake Tahoe, you would basically draw a triangle uh, and you do an angle to the south from both places and where they would meet up, that would more or less be Amador County. And it's the home of, you know, the California gold rush. So, I mean, that was kind of where, you know, and uh, there are a number of, you know, grape growing families that own mines there, you know, Graham McDonald's great grandparents owned a mine. Uh, and so did the Haynes, the Haynes owned a couple mines, the Bourne family. So, you know, it was, it was definitely where everyone had a, you know, the, the, the wealthy in, you know, the miners rarely got wealthy <laughs> themselves. You know, that was, that was the, the siren song to, you know, California. But uh, so it, it really, it's a fascinating place because it, it's, it's definitely more wild and, uh, you know, rural than most places that we grow grapes in California. Yeah, and I think that the historical context of California is just so fascinating all of these families, um, the, the the variety of sites, these heritage vineyards, you know, you just this onion, you just keep peeling it back. And I know that you're, I mean, you're a, a student of history because I admire your book collection and your map right. collection. <laughs> there's, just, there's just so much to learn. And I, one, of the hope, one of the things, I mean, I try to do, I hope that it comes through in writing is that the, the you know, a lot of times people think of California as, you know, it's Russian River Pinot and Oak Chardonnay and big Napa Valley Cabernets, which are all fine. But beyond that, there's all these little pockets of things to explore. And so for me, it's just endless. Well, and I think one of the other things is, you know, it. luckily, if you want to work in these regions, you can, you can make wine that is a bit more reasonably priced. You know, I, I saw, uh, you know, someone, Alice Faring on Twitter saying that, uh, you know, someone recommended, you know, value priced every night wines at $45. And she's like that. And I don't always, you know, that's not my go-to. So, you know, the Sandlands wines, I followed suit. Turley's wines are more reasonable than people believe uh, from direct, but the Sandlands wines run, uh, they run 22 to $35 a bottle. So, yeah. uh, you know, I want people to drink them. I don't want them to kind of sit in their cellar and, you know, I want them to sell the wines they want to sell her, but I don't, you know, I want them to drink them. Well, that's interesting. It's one of the questions before we move to the Zinfandel, which is the first wine from your, your own estate. Yes. Uh, about ageability and what you, 
what you suggest in terms of uh, and keeping these in terms of their potential? Well, I mean, I think it goes back to, you know, we talk a lot about this at Turley and it's, it's a hard, it depends on what people are looking for. And it depends if people, you know, there are some people like so far, I think some of the longest lived wines I've made, my 2011 Chenin Blanc is really just hitting a stride. Unfortunately, I don't think a lot of people kept that wine around. Um, so I, I think the wines are ready to drink on release. But I think, you know, the first, you know, in the first three to five years, they really start to hit their stride. And in all honesty, you know, I've only been making the wines for 10 years. So I would like to say this is what you should. I mean, there are plenty of people who make wine for first time and say this is a 40 year wine. And it's like, you know, maybe it is. I, I don't know. But, you know, I think, you know, it depends on. Uh, what people are looking for, they're looking for more fruit, you know, and this was something the one argument that Larry and Parker always got into was about the ageability of the Turley Zinfandels. And Robert always said, oh, they're, these are 25 year wines. And Larry said, will there be more fruit in 25 years? And Parker said, no. He said, well, what's the point? You know, and for Larry, like the point of the wine, he wants that fruit. And so I think there are a lot of drinkers who, you know, everyone, you know, the famous thing, they talk, you know, dry and uh, you know, drink sweet, where I think a lot of people, you know, they like fresher aromatics and wine. And, you know, realistically, a lot of people don't have a deep cellar to store wine for 20 years till it re reaches its peak. That is for sure a feature of today's generation. Um, so I'm curious, because one of the wines you sent me um, this year was a 2008 Zinfandel, and I was a little bit shocked when I saw this, because I thought that you were not allowed to make Zinfandel or Petite Syrah um, when you started Sandlands just to not have any overlap with Turley. So this is from your your vineyard, Kirshen. It is, yes. Yep. And tell us how you came to start making Zinfandel and what is unique about this, this particular wine. So this is a vineyard that I bought back in 2012. It's out in uh, Lodi and it's on Eastern Lodi. So it's an own rooted vineyard plant in 1915. And I bought it from the Kirschenman family. Most of the grapes go to Turley since day one. Originally, Bedrock and Arnott Roberts and Carlisle bought grapes. They don't buy them any longer. And some other friends, Nathan Candler, who I know you know, who makes his precedent wines, buys. And then it was in 2017, after the fires, Larry and I went over and kind of saw the, the damage going over to have lunch. And we kind of just started a conversation about my future plans. And I said, well, you know, he was asking me how many cases I wanted to make. And I said, it's a hard question to answer. And he goes, it's a number. It's not, you know, hard to answer. I said, well, you know, I do own a Zinfandel vineyard. I'm like, one day we want, and I said, would you ever be comfortable with me making Zinfandel? You know, and after we just kind of drove through, you know, Coffee Park, you know, he, he was like, yeah, I'd be okay with that. And uh, he said, you know, sometime, someday. And so about a month later, we were bottling for Turley. And I said, so what do you think about me making some? And he goes, I said someday. And I'm like, well, today's someday, you know. So he laughed and said, yeah, let's, you can do it. You know, and it, you know, I'd had the vineyard, you know, this was the seventh harvest that, you know, we had had the vineyard. So uh, the main difference between Turley and my version, I don't, I didn't use any new oak on mine at Turley. We used a 20% new. Uh, I didn't use any American oak. And then Turley, what I like to do with the, the vineyards are pretty flat. It's 15 acres of the 1915 planting. And with Turley, what I really like to do is I like to pick as many times as possible. But, you know, during heat spikes and logistics, sometimes you can get two picks in in a year. Sometimes you get four. And so in, with, in 2018, we only got two picks in for Turley. So this was part of the first pick for Turley. And, you know, that was one of the things when I worked in the Rhone with Alain Graillot, you know, they started picking at like 11 and a half potential alcohol and went up to probably 14. And they picked, in theory, the most physiologically ripe 11 and a half percent alcohol. That's, some of that fruit tasted really ripe. And to me, with flatter vineyards, that's kind of one of the, the neat things that you can do is clearly you don't want to be picking at, you know, 19 bricks for Zinfandel or 35, but, you know, you, the, the complexity that you can get uh, 
you know, from picks. So this is just the one pick and it was, you know, picked in the right around 24 and a half. So Duncan and Nathan get their section and they get that a little bit earlier than, you know, I pick and then picked for Turley and some other people and then finished up with Turley, you know, at about 25 and a half, the final Turley pick. And cool. And is it a, is this a Piers Infidel? I don't remember. Is it, is no, it? No. So it's, it's a, it's a field blend. Uh, the, the second most planted variety out here is actually Mondus Noir from the Savoie. And then it's Mondus and then there's Carignan and then there's a little bit of Cinso in there. That's, uh, you know, there's like half a dozen Cinso vines uh, that are out in the vineyard. Uh, so, you know, this wine, I would say it's 95% Zinfandel you know, in the kind of two to three percent Carignan and two to three percent Mondus. That's really interesting. So since you mentioned, so I don't I remember if you just mentioned just now or not, but we have Carignan also to taste, which is, we do, which is one of my favorite varieties, not just in California, but in Sardinia and other regions um, because of its purity of fruit. So your 18 is Contra, Contra Costa. Yes. And from where exactly? So it's from the town of Oakley, and there really are three, Oakley's right on the Delta, it's a Delta town, and there are three main sections of Oakley, there's out where the furthest away from the Delta is where Pato Vineyard is, and then another vineyard truly works with Maury, then there's what's called Oakley Road that's kind of in between the Delta and the vineyards that are close, like Evangelo and some of the Klein vineyards are right on the, really close to the Delta. And so what you do is the vineyards that are closest to the Delta usually have higher yields, but higher natural acidity. And then once you get a little further away, you still keep the natural acidity, not as high, but you get a little more density. And then when you get further out, you get more density and not as much acid. So to me, we always made a wine called Salvador that was unfortunately ripped out. Uh, I still haven't brought myself to drive by and see it, but it was torn out for housing, which with what's going on now, who knows, the houses may never be built. But so this is a vineyard off Oakley Road planted in 1922. Uh, it's head trained, dry farmed, own rooted. And this is what I, this was the first wine I released for Sandlands. Okay. And so one of the questions we have is about the varieties being planted in these vineyards, but these are all obviously decisions that were taken many, many, many generations ago. Correct. Those are the original, that was what was planted way back then. Well, and, and of course, in Contra Costa was primarily planted. Uh, so, I mean, it was primarily planted by Portuguese, kind of Western Contra Costa had more Italians. So, you know, the, the Klein family was also part of the Jacuzzi family, you know, and it's also where Joe DiMaggio was born and his dad was a fisherman farmer. Uh, but most of Contra Costa was settled by uh, Portuguese uh, fishermen. So it's right there on that, you know, we had the second largest salmon run in, uh, in the U.S. there in the Delta before, you know, this everything's interlinked, but before hydraulic mining in the foothills silted the Delta. And that was actually the beginning and the start of the first Environmental Protection Act, because all these Portuguese fishermen, actually, they lost their, you know, their way of supporting their family when the Delta was silted by hydraulic mining. And uh, so a lot of them had dipped their toe into agriculture before, but there was a big push once the Delta was silted, you know, into, uh, you know, grape growing and, you know, uh, almonds and walnuts. Yeah, I mean, that's just so fascinating. Um, help us understand, help us locate Costa, Contra Costa County. Where, where exactly, what are we close to? So it, it's, it's pretty close. It's just east of the town of Concord by probably, I think, 20 miles. And just over the hill from Berkeley, actually, like if you look, if you went over the hill to Berkeley, you go into Concord and Martinez, and Martinez is in Contra Costa County, and then you would head east, and the delta is formed by Northern California's two longest rivers, the, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin, and it's right where they meet that there's a uh, crosswind. If you ever go out Highway 12 going out to Lodi, there are all the wind turbines. You know, it's the biggest collection of wind turbines in Northern California. And then it's right at the base of Mount Diablo. So uh, that's the easiest way to think of where the vineyards are. You know, they're at the base of Mount Diablo. And it's, there are all these, it's, it's what's classified as Delhi blow sand, like New Delhi, D-E-H-L-I, 
blow sand. And what it's done is it's where those two rivers are meeting. It's creating this crosswind. So it's, it's actually sand that's being deposited by wind instead of water. And that does two things. Uh, one, the, the sand is very, very jagged. You know, it's that hydraulic action of uh, alluvial that actually rounds the edges of sand. And the other thing is there's very low organic matter. So, you know, I, uh, you know, when you look under a scope at the sand in Contra Costa, it looks so much different than, you know, it looks like fractured glass under, under a, you know, a, a gem scope. And, you know, it's just pretty fascinating. I mean, a lot of the vineyards have like 0.1, 0.2% organic matter. You know, technically, if you went to a university, they say you can't grow grapes in these soils. But I mean, people just did it anyway. And, you know, there's no phylloxera out there. All the vines are own rooted. They're very healthy. It's that crosswind and what deposited the sand, it's extremely windy, which is the best thing for disease prevention. So very little powdery mildew, very little mites. Uh, it really is a special place to grow grapes. It's basically being decimated by urban sprawl. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a challenge, I think, in a lot of regions in the world. Um, I know we've got a couple of whites to taste and some yes. questions on those, which is which we'll get to in one second. But I'm curious, we've tasted three 2018 yes. reds. What's your view of the of the vintage? What defines this growing season and the wines, in your opinion? It was, you know, I mean, I look at, I think to, I, the one, the vintage I would compare it to would be 2013. But I think that we've had enough time. I've realized that 2013 is kind of that wine geek vintage. The wines are going to age really well. You know, I love them. I just think they're, but they're also, they're not lean, but they don't have a lot of plush fruit in them, you know, and the 18s have that plush fruit that 13 didn't have. So I think consumers are going to, I mean, I think the vintage is fantastic. It was an amazing vintage for Zinfandel, uh, you know, I believe across the board, but for everything, I mean, acids were really great. Yields were up, you know, you know, we're, and this is coming out of the drought. So heat spikes we saw in 17, you know, it was just a really neat uh, vintage to make wine from. And, it was abundant, uh, you know, that there's, I think a lot of Napa Cab was up 40%. Uh, you know, the wines just have plushness, but it, when you look at them from a chemistry standpoint, they have some of the better acidity we've seen in a long time, you know, but usually that doesn't come with that kind of plushness and, you know, fruit forwardness and supple fruit uh, that you get. Yeah, I mean, when I've tasted this, this vintage, not just your wines, but just in general, there's an incredible purity to the flavors and like they're really yeah. defined and the wines are juicy but they're not heavy i thought 13 was much more drought and drought influence much more tannic and powerful for sure you but know i mean i think these wines these wines showed a similar tannin when they were young but i think there was you know that density in these wines that actually you know has buffered that better than what we saw in 13. that's, that's fascinating i mean i think the, the one thing i will say i you know, 2018 vintage is going to be such a great vintage for wine drinkers, specifically with like Cabernet. There was such an abundance that, you know, there's going to be some really reasonably priced, like amazing wines, which I think will hopefully get some more young people drinking wine, you know, that they'll be able to have Napa Cab at 25 bucks a bottle again. You know, it might not be the top examples, but at least they can, you know, they can afford it. Yeah, well, 2018 was abundant and also 2019, as you 2019, know. 2019, for sure. So, uh, I mean, I remember being in Napa Valley during the harvest and and having winemakers and consultants getting these last minute calls. Like, calls, hey, this fruit. for sure. Yeah, and I mean, I think that, that more of that's going to go on this year, too. You know, I mean, you just look at sellers are full. You know, there's been probably a, a you know, we'll see what happens for fall releases, but I'm guessing there's going to be a slowdown in the market. You know, and, you know, again, most Cabernet, you know, people haven't bottled most of their 18s yet from a Cabernet standpoint. So there's a lot of wine, you know, in tank and barrel, you know, from 18 to 19. The good thing is, you know, I, I would be happier having 18 and 19 in barrel that you have to work through than having more of like, you know, 15 or 17, you know, really drought or heat spike influenced years where I think you're spot on with the eight, the purity of 18 
is something that, you know, I look at 17 was wines of, you know, the climate and the growing season. And I think sometimes that can overshadow, and I'm not talking about the fire influence wines, but I think some of that can overshadow, like it starts playing more uh, into the wines than the actual sites they're grown in. Yeah, for sure. That's a very, yeah, vintage that's defined by a lot of other things that don't have to do anything with the vineyard. Exactly. So Chenin Blanc yes. is a heritage variety for California, but I'm also interested, not just me, but some of our viewers are interested in the inspiration for this wine. Is it more California or is it also informed by some of your experiences abroad? So it's, it's definitely, I think, in, influenced by, you know, I, I've always been a fan of Loire Valley Chenin. And, you know, I think it, it's an interesting thing to think about, like, when you say influence, because, you know, I think when you say that you're influenced by a wine, consumers or other people, you know, are going to say that wine, your wine should taste like that influence. And, you know, I think you know, you're a musician. I think there are a lot of musicians that are influenced by another musician. It doesn't mean their music sounds the same. And for me, you know, I was influenced by the Loire and then it wasn't, and I knew the history of Chenin Blanc in California. It wasn't until I went to South Africa that I really understood and I'd enjoyed the South African Chenins that you could make Mediterranean Chenin, you know, that it did really, really well. And the vineyard that I'm working with in Amador is just down the road from the, the Mission Vineyard. And uh, it's a vineyard that it's on what we call the Story Vineyard that Turley makes a wine called Judge Bell from. And uh, I had looked at it for like four years. And then finally in 2011, I was able to buy the fruit. So that's this wine and how it, the, this wine in this vintage, it's very, very transparent. And it, but it yep. also has that phenolic weight. So how did you, how is this wine made in the cellar? So the, the interesting thing is it's, it looks, if you drove by the vineyard before Verasian, you would think it's an old Zinfandel vineyard. It's, it's head trained, it's dry farmed Chenin Blanc. So it looks like an old Zinfandel vineyard uh, and it's own rooted. So, I mean, you're looking at a dry Mediterranean climate with volcanics, quartz and granite, and you have Chenin Blanc. So, you know, the yields are never what, you know, you would see in regions that, you know, vineyards would be irrigated. I mean, it's usually about two tons to the acre and the acidity is always in check and it does have this like phenolic, you know, it's, it gets that freckle. That's the good thing with Shannon, especially Medi in Loarshan, you get this freckle, you know, it gets freckles on the skins and that's kind of the sign of knowing that it's getting ready to pick. Uh, but again, you know, I think this wine is right at 12% alcohol and it has weight. And I tell people, if you would have told me 15 years ago that you could pick, you know, right around 20 bricks Shannon Blanc and it would have this weight and it just wouldn't be like this screechy, green bean wine, I wouldn't believe you. Yeah, this turned out really, really nice. And then I have yeah, to- no, I, I'm happy with it. Uh, you know, and it's a vineyard, I feel lucky. Again, I don't know how long, you know, I've, th this is the uh, eighth vintage that we've made. And, you know, you just look at it and, you know, it's, it's a low, I mean, I pay them as much as they want for the fruit. I tell them every year, if you want more money, just let me know. You know, it's not a big money maker for us, but it, you know, the interesting thing in Amador County was the, and just a history question or lesson for everyone about California Shannon, the first varietally labeled Shannon Blanc in California was made by the Mondavi brothers and, and it was the 54 vintage, but it won the 50, I can't tell actually if it was the 54, it was the 55 California State Fair, it won the best white wine. And it was labeled Chenin Blanc from Charles Krug. And no one had ever really heard of Chenin Blanc. But at that point, the California State Fair was the end all be all of if you ran, won the blue ribbon for white wine, that was the greatest thing you could do in not just California, but basically, you know, the United States. So Charles Krug had this huge boom with Chenin Blanc. You know, the McDonald's had Chenin Blanc planted at Tokelon. And I like to believe that's where that 1955 wine was from, you know. Uh, but so actually the general manager after Robert left uh, Charles Krug at, uh, at, at Charles Krug, the guy who kind of took over, he was actually from Amador County. 
So in like the late sixties, he got all of his friends to start planning head train dry farm Chenin Blanc to go to Charles Krug. And so there were a number of, you know, Shen it was just that this revitalization with Sutter home and Charlie Meyer to, uh, and Daryl Cordy to bring Amador County back into the public eye. So there's this big planning boom, but you know, Charles Krug had a lot to do with it. Uh, I mean, I just think it, that's just absolutely fascinating. And the wine is really expressive. Um, Thank you. The, the, big, the other big difference with this is it's the first year that this wine has, you know, half of it aged in a five-year-old thousand liter uh, Pausha, you know, uh, large Fudra. So, you know, it, it was less, you know, 228 Burgundy barrels than before. So half barrels, half cask. No, well, yeah, exactly. And malolactic fermentation? Malolactic fermentation, you know, it usually takes about 11 months. So this wine goes about 11 months with no sulfur, and then it gets a couple sulfurins before we bottle it. But it's unfined and unfiltered, and it sees about 15 months on its leaves before it's bottled. Wow. That's fantastic. And then we have one last wine that I, yes. I laughed when I knew that you were making this wine because yes. it's Chardonnay. Yes. There's anything wrong with Chardonnay, but uh, may not be the, the variety that most people would associate with you. So what's the story with this wine? How did it come to be? So I grew up in Napa and I, my parents lived downtown and uh, my dad built a house out Coombsville road for my mom when we were young. He, uh, and, you know, we started making our own wine and, you know, we would have dinners with my parents and, you know, we would always kind of, bring wine and you know we were always bringing Sandland Chenin Blanc or other Chenin Blancs and my mom just always shied away with, from it and then you know the vineyard is the Haynes vineyard Haynes with an S so it's the oldest vineyard Chardonnay white planting out in Coombsville was planted in 1966 and it's about a mile from my parents house and my friend John Lockwood who uh you know has his own uh label he he let me buy a little bit of his uh you know Haynes 1966 so this is on St. George rootstock this is the vineyard recently that was bought by the uh Heights group yeah. so uh you know really interesting soils it was Andre Chelichev helped consult with the planning and you know it went to and Louis Martini so it went to Louis Martini originally uh and they planted Pinot Noir and Chardonnay so Basically, I made a made Chardonnay so my mom would have a, one of our wines to drink when you know we had we had them over, and she loves it. You know, so uh, the problem is now you know I give her the wine, but she doesn't want to drink it. You know, she wants to like keep it, and I said no, like I made this wine for you, so you you drink it. So uh, no, it's a really special vineyard, and you know I I I also made in seventeen a Coombsville Merlot. Uh, that's from the Michael Black Vineyard. And that was a vineyard that Paul Hobbs made famous in the 90s and through the 2000s. And so they're both, they both say Coombsville instead of Sandlands on the label, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, to, to honor, you know, the area that I grew up in. I've got that wine here somewhere. Right here. Coombsville Merlot. That's and it. Coombsville is in the southern part of Napa Valley, which, and so the wines are, naturally a little bit more savory and more, yes. a little bit more, I'm not, herbal's not the right word, but they're a little bit more savory and more minerally than more up valley type. Example. Well, you think, I mean, in the eighties, you know, people didn't believe you could grow uh, Bordeaux varieties. You know, that vineyard was planted in 1985 on a hillside. And that was like a far out thing in Napa Valley to plant, you know, Merlot. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, who, who Massimo worked from, uh, worked for. Ferrella. Ferrella was, I think, the first person to plant Cabernet actually out there. But, you know, you look at the Haynes Vineyard and it's in these gravelly volcanic soils and they planted Pinot Noir, you know, and there was a lot of Pinot and Chardonnay being planted in Coombsville. You know, now it's kind of, there is the one old historic Zinfandel Vineyard that Turley used to make called more, we called it more Earthquake and it goes to Bialy now and they call it rw more i'm sure you've had the and you know it's that vineyard's plan 1905 and 1906 and it's it's the true kind of legend of coombsville yeah and no, i mean it's a fascinating area and there's a lot of people making really interesting wines there right now curious we have a question about vinification for reds and the use yes. of whole cluster 
Yes. What's your view? Is it an overarching philosophy or does it depend a lot from wine to wine? Well, it, 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 it's, it is a philosophy and that's actually why I went to work at Alain Grios. I specifically wanted to work for a producer. I mean, this is back in 2005. There, there weren't many people. Aaron Jordan was making his Syrahs with whole cluster then and a little bit of Pinot, but it was before, you know, and I was pretty fascinated by seeing Aaron's Syrahs. And so I went and worked at Grios because they used all whole cluster. And then I use it primarily on my reds, but the the Merlot and the Mission are both destemmed. So the Mission gets destemmed, and then all the other wines are whole cluster. And the Mission the, and the Merlot, it, besides the Merlot and the Mission, yeah. So and then the biggest thing that I do is, you know, you see a lot of people, you know, with you know, Instagram or whatever now, you know, like everyone wants to have the I love Lucy moment with whole cluster. You know, everyone's treading and treading. And I, you know, at Gryo, they only did pump overs. So they kind of macerated the fruit whole cluster and put it in tank. And then there was no mechanical breakage after that. And that's something that I really strive to do is that I don't want to, you know, during fermentation, be breaking up stems with a punch down tool. I think that's where you get a lot of the bitter green, you know, where everyone just says, wow, those wines are clearly whole cluster, you know. And again, I don't want, it's interesting because, you know, I feel like some of the older vineyards and some winemaker friends have agreed with me that the some of the older vineyards that have a natural extract without, you know, like you look at the Carignan that we had. I mean, that's a 12.9% alcohol wine that's dark and extracted. And it's, I'm not doing anything but one to two pump overs a day, you know, and it's not picked over ripe. And I feel like that extract really helps buffer that whole clusterness that you can you know, get, uh, and I, you know, sometimes I feel like you get a lot of more of the whole cluster aromatics as well when the alcohols get higher. And I guess the Zinfandel's destemmed. The Zinfandel's not whole cluster. Okay. But if you do whole cluster, is it 100% or, or is it somewhere in the middle? 100%. 100%. So it's either 100% or nothing. Exactly. So like when I taste the Carignan, I mean, if I didn't know it was whole cluster, I would have never, I would never say it's. Well, and that, in all honesty, like I stopped when I do my write-ups on my website, I stopped even, I don't hide it from anyone, but I don't want that to be a focal point because I don't think it shows in the wine as much as like, I think there are certain things in if being a responsible, you know, wine producer slash salesperson that you should tell people if you use 200% new oak, because there are people who don't like that, you know, and I feel like there's some wines that are really stemmy that if you the wines are really stemmy, you should probably tell them, hey, these are really stemmy wines. Yeah, because it can be a very strong characteristic in a wine. For sure. And if people, you know, the, the biggest thing as a producer, like, I don't want to try to convince people that my wines are for them. You know, you kind of want to find the people that are open minded to trying new things. And, you know, clearly people will gravitate that they like some wines more than others. But I don't feel that, uh, you know, I don't, believe that everyone's going to love my wines, but I, you know, I, when people have asked me, I kind of look at them as, you know, it's not the right term, but it's the way the you know, bistro wines, like when you eat at a bistro and like, you know, they're interesting, it's well done, you know, it doesn't break the bank. Uh, you know, that's kind of what I'm shooting for, uh, you know, when, when we make the wines. Do you think that with Zinfandel, it's just overpowering? Is that why you don't do it? Or is there some other... Well, I think when we first, so when we first, we, at Turley, we had tried whole cluster before. And again, we tried it with, you know, some of the vineyards like Uberoth and the estate when the wines were pushing 16% alcohol. And to me, those wines always tasted like Fernet. You know, there was just so much. And in 2012, I mean, I've never really told a friend how they should make their wine, but I pleaded with Duncan and Nathan not to do 100% whole cluster on their 12. And it turned out really, really, the 12 was fantastic. And I'm like, okay, like clearly they know what they're doing with whole cluster. So part of that makes me think alcohol has a lot to play in with how whole cluster shows. So if you're making a 15-6 Russian River Pinot, it's probably going to show in a different way than a, you know, 12 and a half percent Burgundy. And so I'm not opposed to trying it, but I just, you know, I wasn't a hundred percent. I know how to make Zinfandel the way I've always made it at Turley. 
And so I really didn't want to deviate too much from that. But, uh, you know, I mean, Duncan and Nathan's wines, you know, they're 18s fantastic. So, you know, I, you know, and that's people have always asked me why I sell grapes to friends. And I'm like, look, if, if six other friends make wine from my vineyard, you know, Turley and five others, and, you know, in 10 years, I'll have 70 examples to look back on and think, how did they make this? What did they do? And I mean, as a vineyard owner who wants to make wine from the vineyard for the rest of my life, you know, what better thing than to have, you know, in 10 years, 70 examples of wine that was made and kind of to really, you know, I may have, you know, 35, 30 harvests left. I want to learn as much as possible in that short time. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So we have time for one last question real quick. Yes. Um, now that you've moved to two releases for Stanlands, are there other wines coming or is this more or less? Correct. Wine? So, so the wines that will be coming, uh, the Zinfandel will be in the second release. Uh, I made Grenache from the Bess, Besson Vineyard down in Santa Clara. That was the original source of uh, Randall Graham's, uh, uh, which wine of his, his Cigar Volant. Yeah. It's owned or leased and farmed by the guys who make the Birakino wines. Angela Osborne gets some of the fruit. So I was lucky enough to get that in 18. There's the Soberana Syrah. There's the Enns Mataro. And the, the Amador Shannon will be in the fall release. And I know there's another wine or two. Uh, oh, and the Contra, or the Contra Costa Red Table wine. That, okay. that's, that's Carignan Mataro, where the Lodi Red Table wine is Sinso, Carignan, Zinfandel, a third, a third, a third. Awesome. Well, Tegan, thanks very much. I know you're really busy right now with the no, two. Th thank you. <laughs> your time. Thanks, everyone, for Thank watching. you. Thanks for your questions. And tomorrow we'll have Neil Martin. We'll bug him about 80s music, Bordeaux, and Burgundy. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a great night. Thank you, Tegan, again. Thank you, Antonio, for having me. Pleasure as always. Okay. Bye-bye.